Hello, everybody, um, and welcome to uh, tonight's event um, in conversation with Maxine Peake, an event which celebrates Maxine's appointment as Honorary Professor of Literature and Performance at the University's School of Arts, Languages and Culture, and which we're delighted to be hosting um, on International Women's Day. I'm going to begin, as we do these days, by telling you about this event and how, it, how it's going to work. My name is John McAuliffe. I'm a poet and I direct the University's Centre for New Writing. I am also a member of the Creative Manchester Group, and this event happily brings both of those interests together. Creative Manchester is a university-wide initiative which supports and develops creative activity within and out with the university, linking what my colleagues and I do with the kinds of organization which themselves make and develop new work, including in the creative industries, where Maxine's stage and screen work have made such an impact for more than three decades. The Centre for New Writing works with undergraduate and postgraduate writers, and I think many of them are here tonight, to develop their writing skills and to introduce them to the context in which the work of writers circulates. It's an exciting position to be in, working with talented and ambitious writers. And I'm glad to say that I'll be handing over to three of our students later on, um, Lydia Gilbert, Imogen Fahey, and Caitlin Norbury, who will have questions from Maxine relating to her practice as a writer and an actress. But I'm getting a bit of ahead of myself by talking about what we're gonna say later. We would much rather that we were running this event in the Arts Lecture Hall in the University Samuel Alexander Building or in the Martin Harris Center's Cosmo Rodewald Hall, where we had planned to do this last year. But there are advantages to Zoom. And one of them is that you can use the chat and the Q&A functions, which are both at the bottom of your screen. Please do pop a line into the chat now telling us where you're watching from tonight and maybe about your favorite of Maxine's roles. And if you have a question for Maxine, please use that other Q&A button at the end of the screen. And um, we hope to have time afterwards to include some of those questions in our conversation. After I introduce Maxine, she's going to speak briefly about her work before beginning uh, and in conversation with my colleague, Professor Maggie Gale. Maggie is the author of a social history of British performance cultures and an authority too on professional, the professional lives of mid 20th century actresses and playwrights, as well as being an expert on contemporary theater. Maxine will talk to Maggie about her work and then respond to some of our students' questions and then to the questions that you post in the Q&A. So, Maxine Peake grew up in Bolton and was a youth member of Bolton's Octagon Theatre and Manchester's Royal Exchange. Maxine studied performing arts at Salford City College and went on to train further at RADA. The story of her accessing further education and receiving the Patricia Rothermere Fellowship at RADA was told as a South Bank Show special in 1996. Maxine is possibly best known nationally for her television work in classic series like Victoria Wood's Dinner Ladies in Shameless and in Silk, as well as for her portrait of Myra Hindley in See No Evil, and more recently her appearances in Black Mirror and in the reprise of Alan Bennett's Talking Heads. Her cinema work includes Theory of Everything, Clubbed, Peterloo, and an acclaimed performance in the recent story of stand-up comedy on the Northern Circuit, Funny Cow. Maxine has also written for radio and stage in Beryl and in the brilliantly titled Queens of the Coal Age. In Manchester though, and especially for her work at the Royal Exchange where the latter play was performed, Maxine Peake has enriched audiences at the theater for more than a decade. Now associate artist at the Exchange, the cultural life of the city always includes conversation about her performances there, occasionally in tandem with the International Festival. Her work at the Exchange includes Shelley's The Mask of Anarchy, a mesmerizing playing of Hamlet, Miss Julie, Winnie in Happy Days, Blanche in Streetcar, and in one of the best shows I have ever seen, an amazing and electrifying performance in Carol Churchill's The Striker. There's a lot to talk about tonight, 
and I'm very glad now to hand over to our new Honorary Professor of Literature and Performance, Maxine Peake. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, hey, there's a good turnout tonight. So thank you all so much for giving up this evening to listen in. And I just want to say how honoured I am to receive the honorary professorship. It was, um, it was quite a surprise. And initially, you know, I'm always a little bit sceptical about awards and, and titles and things. But somebody said to me, actually, that generally when these things are given out, it's women say no. A lot of these sort of, you know, things from university, sort of honorary degrees, honorary professorships. And I thought that's really interesting. Um, so I thought I'm going to say yes. And I think that's what we, on International Women's Day, we need to take forward is us as women saying yes, being more vocal and showing off a little bit more. But I know it's not just women here this evening. And what my what I'm really excited about with my professorship is the work that I can do with the students. For me, this feels like a collaboration and I hope that's where we'll take it forward. It's not just what I can offer you, it's very much what you can offer me with your skills because you are the future of this generation. Now you are the future of our industry, which obviously is, has taken a real bat battering recently. And you know, my hope is that there will be a new well, there'll be a new landscape out there and which will mean new work, new ways of making work, new voices, the storytellers and who is allowed to tell the stories needs to be broken apart and that more people have control over their own stories, more people, you know, of colour, more women of colour, more women, more pe working class people, more, you know, just a huge diverse group of people in positions of power within the industry that's producers and obviously writers and I'm really excited tonight that I'm going to be interviewed by three female writers um yeah so that's it really but just want to say thank you so much it's a real honor and I know you know it's been a really difficult time for everybody and I know as a student it's been really difficult because you've not been able to be in spaces with each other and I know Manchester University has had its troubles recently and I'm very proud of the students and and their activism and um yes so thank you very much for the appointment and I'm really looking forward to your questions thank you Maxine and again just to reiterate what John said we're very very pleased to have you on board and um it, very exciting as you said be very exciting collaboration moving forward I'm I thought I'd just ask you a range of questions um about about your work i think as a, as a, a theater historian often uh women don't talk about their work they talk about their family or they talk about people they know but they don't talk about their work and there's a kind of assumption that women don't have a method or um you know that they don't kind of approach their work technically and so on but i wanted to start i read and um, there's a really lovely piece in the guardian with kush jumbo and Anne marie mcduff and they were talking about how much they missed the space of theatre and the camaraderie of working in teams and you've talked a lot about working in teams and I just wondered in reference to this last year what's what's the thing that you've missed most about um stage work it has been being in the room it's been in the room with a group of people and it's the energy the creative energy that you you know that you you absorb from that just, I mean, I said to a friend the other day, we always sort of laugh on the first day of rehearsals and everybody sits around the table and you chat and then it becomes a bit of a therapy session and everybody will spin off. And, I, you know, I said to a friend, I said, I really miss, anybody can talk about anything. I just want to be in that room, you know, with the actors, just all chatting, you know, it can take days and days and, and, and it's just a real, I think it's just an outpouring of, of expression and energy. But I, I feed off that. And I really feed off acting as a team sport. I know not all actors do, but for me, that's really important. And I've realised now more than ever how much to me that is, is the sort of lifeblood of the work I do, is the people that you're in the room with and what you get from each other. Acting to me, performing is about an exchange of energy. It's not just about your energy. It's about the energy with the people on stage with, the people in the room with, and it's the, the audience. And yeah, I find it quite difficult when I haven't got that to feed off. And, and 
you, you, you've got an unusual career in that you you start very quickly out of drama school. You've got, um, a, you know, a very kind of public role in, in Dinner Ladies, which was one of my favourite roles. <laughs> but in some of your interviews, you talk about how when you were at drama school, that you were told that, um, you know, you would play kind of bawdy girls and, and sort of comedy roles. But you've ended up being one of our, you know, our lead actresses in the UK and a much loved actress. Well, was there a point at which you felt that switch beginning to happen? I think it was interesting. I was always, and I was very happy. I wanted to be a, a, a com, you know, a comedy actor. I, I was a, call myself a character actor. I'm very proud of that. You know, it was always seen as a bit of derogatory, you know, character actor. It's meant you weren't attractive enough to play the, the you know, female juve leads. But I was always a bit like, who wants to play? You know, I remember being told at, at Radio, if I didn't lay off the chips, I'd never play Juliet. And my <laughs> response was, I don't want to play Juliet. I mean, she kills herself for love at 16. She's proper boring. You know what I mean? But it was that I had the attitude of, you know, I'd always, you know, it's defensive, but it was, yeah, so it it didn't it didn't really bother me, but I, I just think once I started, I, I'm all, I'm always up for a challenge, and I thought, right, well, I'm going to get stuck. And after dinner, ladies, everything was the same. It was sort of substandard, twinkle type characters, and um, and then it was really when Cena Weevil came about the uh, the piece about the Moors murders, and I just remember thinking, this is something I'd love to to be part of, maybe naively at the time. Anyway, it transpired after a lot of pushing and pulling, I, I got the job. And then after that, it really switched. The parts, the comedy parts stopped coming in and there were these very sort of complex sort of, you, you know, women, which are the women I wanted to play, but I found nobody then, <laughs> we got on that role and it was, it was hard then to be seen as somebody who was funny, which was, which was fine, but I think, people start to think that's your personality. You know, it's always, oh, she does gritty. But um, yeah, I, to me, it's, I'm just attracted to the part usually. It's the story first and foremost, then it's the part. But yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not averse to being a part of something that's just good and fun and wacky and entertaining, you know, but it, 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 is, it, it is interesting because I never saw myself becoming the actress I suppose I'd, I'd become. It, yeah, it was it was a shock and a surprise, but every actor says you're only as good as your last job. So you don't dwell on it. You don't no. sit and think, oh, I've done really well, because all you're thinking of is how do I maintain this? How do I move forward? You know, so. So yeah. did did Funny Cow as a film, um, did, did that feel, because it's written by an actor. Yeah. Did, did it feel a, a bit of a kind of coming full circle? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think because Tony Pitts, who wrote it, had written it for me. And it's an idea I'd had for years. I was at drama school and we had to read something in first person from a novel. And I uh, picked uh, Marty Kane's Coward's Chronicles. And I'd always thought I'd love, because I grew up going to working men's clubs when I was a kid and I had a bit of a love-hate relationship with them. And I was always fascinated by the women who got up on those stages because they were very male, like, toxic places, really. You know, even as a young, you know, as a, a young person. A child and and you know it was yeah it was sort of fascinating had a dark fascination with the the atmosphere there so so yeah I mean because I've always said as well that was the first that was the, my first experience of performance was watching somebody on a stage either sing or tell jokes so I thought that was <laughs> as far as I could go so at one point when I was very early I was thinking oh well maybe I'll be a comedian I'd like to do comedy you know and then then found Victoria Wood and Julie Walters and as I was sort of you know early teens and and thought that would be a possibility but yeah funny cow to me I always used to say if if, if we can get this film made because it took us nine years to get yeah. it made nobody was interested nobody was for a long long time um you know I felt I could sort of happily retire but then you do that and then you go right what's next you know because that's the drive that keeps you doing what you do and and so you you're um you 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 talking in that I I found bits of the Melvin Bragg um, Southbank show what an extraordinary thing I don't know how that came about had you got into Rada when they decided to make it yeah it was a bit slightly mocked up at the beginning what happened was I'd got so I got as you as as John said I got the Patricia Rothermere Award which she was 
each drama school in the country nominated a student who otherwise couldn't afford to go to drama school. So I was nominated from RADA, um, you know, single parent family. There was just no way I'd got in. They got, they, I got a phone call saying, you're in, but you have to find the money. And I said, well, I, I'm not coming then. I'm like, that's, I, you know, I can't give you anything. So they put me forward for this Patricia Rutherford award, which they, the Daily Mail, <laughs> the, my, my, my favourite, my fans, the Daily Mail, um, every two years put in its, its, its fees and maintenance that you get. So it's an amazing, you know, it's an amazing scholarship. And it was in the memory of Patricia Rutherford, who was the, the then just recently deceased um, Lady Rutherford. So I'd gone to the Evening Standard Awards to collect the award. And Daniel Wiles, he was called, who directed the South Bank, who had seen it and went, oh, crikey, there's somebody going to Raja who sounds like that and looks like that. Yeah. Because I think he sort of didn't realise that, you know, Raja had come on a bit. And, and I always had, you know, every drama school, you know, you know there's still issues with, with the diversity of students. But I think, you know, there had been other northerners and other people from regions. Yeah. Um, so it, it was a bit of a shock to him. So then I remember getting called into the principal's office and saying they'd like to make a documentary about you. And I said, no, straight away. I said, because my career will be over before it started. Because I sort of knew the power of these things. And I remember there'd been a drama school one, funnily enough, that Anne-Marie Duff before she was, you know, I'd become a professional actor. And I'd watched it and went, I, you know, I mean, we'd all sort of watched it in the drama school. I thought, I don't want to do this. I'll, I'll get typecast. I'll, I'll be, you know, I'll get put in a box and I've not even left Raja. So they sort of gradually taught me round, and 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 then eventually I sort of agreed to it. You know, rather it'd be very good for them, it'd be good publicity, blah blah blah. And in the end, I thought, okay, I'll 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 do it. That must have been quite difficult for a young person in the big city to have cameras following them round. And you were very good. You're very articulate and confident in it. Yeah, I think, to be honest, the whole thing, getting into Raja itself, everything was just a bit... I think my naivety, I always say, got me a long way <laughs> because I didn't really think about it. If I'd have given it too much thought, like getting my first job on leaving at Raja was with Victoria Wood, I think I might have had a bit of a meltdown if I'd really thought about what was happening to me too much. I'm, I was very much in just live, you know, live in the moment, live day to day. So I, I didn't... I didn't really, and I think most of us don't do it. We don't really think about it. We take on the task in hand and, and don't dwell on it too much. But definitely the sort of naivety of youth got me through it. I, I remember thinking, oh, I don't, you know, I hope anybody doesn't think I'm too big for my boots. But I've, n I've never thought that people would think that about me. I didn't think there'd be jealousy or anything like that from the rest of the students because I sort of was this very northern rotund tomboy so I wasn't a threat to anybody at the time so I, I sort of managed to sweep through slightly unnoticed and and everyone just thought it was quite amusing you know so so you that naivety kind of helped you in a way not coming from a theatrical background sort of helped you be fearless yeah I think he just I mean I was nervous but I didn't really think of the, the consequences like I said the only consequences I thought was oh no they'll I'll be on telly as me is this very with my big broad northern accent and and at home in Bolton and they'll be showing the council estate where I grew up on and then that'll be it I'll be <laughs> you know I'll be I'll be tight which sort of you know it did sort of happen and I think I've spent then one of my driving forces the rest of my career is this odd Greek chorus I don't quite know with <laughs> the actual faces are that I'm trying desperately not to be typecast you know I think that's actually what propels me forward and I say well I'm 46 now maybe I can take the foot off the gas a bit and stop worrying but you, it's funny how those things that are planted so early on are the things that keep sort of driving you forward even if they're not a true fact anymore you know do you because uh, you, you were talking about kind of the energy of being in the room and working with teams and that and there's a sort of creative partnership that you've had with Sarah Frankham yeah. while she was at the Royal Exchange and can you can you tell us a bit about that did you choose roles did she choose roles to be honest, initially, Sarah Franken got in touch. I didn't know her. I tried for years to get seen at, at the Royal Exchange. 
<laughs> me and, and and yeah, ask Christopher Eccleston his story. If you ever speak to Christopher Eccleston, ask him story his story too. He, he used to work on the crew and go up and put his picture on top of the casting <laughs> pile, and he never got he never got notice. So for years, I'd tried. I'd left drama school. I'd written to the casting director. I'd got my agent to chase up, and I'd got this. You know, Maxine's not ready to work here yet, and I was really annoyed because. Fabulous Tobias Menzies was in my year at Raja. Got an audition straight out and got a part. And I was like, well, I am not ready. She doesn't even know who I am. But anyway, that was, but there was a little, I'm going to be very indiscreet now, but there was a little bit of a rumour with especially Northern actors that <laughs> we weren't probably good enough. You know, they didn't think we were quite good enough under certain management to work at the Royal Exchange. Yeah. True or not, you know, it, yeah. but it was. So it, it took me, it was till Sir Frankham became involved and I just got a phone call from my agent saying, She's doing Rutherford and Son, and she'd like to offer you the part. And I was, you know, I'd, I'd never met her, and I was so excited. I thought, well, that's very brave of her to make a straight offer. So I went up and worked with them. We did Rutherford and Son. I don't think it was a particular, it was an okay production. You know, I don't think it, 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 it was completely successful, but, and, and that was it. And off I went, and I, I didn't know whether I'd work there again. And then a couple of years later, maybe, Three or four, three years later. So we got in touch again about the children's hour. And that's when it sort of clicked with us. Mm. I don't think we quite clicked the first time. And then we did the children's hour with fabulous Shell Emerson, Kettle, Flame, Milo, Tume, June Watson, brilliant cast. And, and you know, Rutherford well, was a brilliant cast. And me and Sarah just clicked. And after that, she said to me, What would you like to do next? And I said, Well, I'd like to have a go at Miss Julie. And I thought she'd laugh me, you know. Yeah. I thought I might as well give it a go because I'd played Christine. You know, I'd done the <laughs> with Chris Eccleston and played, you know, Christian the cook. Yeah. And um, and I'd always watch the brilliant Ashley or Sullivan who was playing Miss Julie going, I'd love to have a go at that, you know. Um, so so we said, Oh, well, funny enough, I was been thinking about that. So we did it. So it's always been a little bit of a you know, and then after Miss Julie, you know, we 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 did Hamlet, and that was that came from me because I have a complete trust with Sarah. I think if Sarah thinks I can do it, and this is a lesson I've learned as well, is if somebody else thinks I can do it, it's not my business whether I can. <laughs> I think I can do it or not, because if I went off, my first instinct would be, oh, I can't, it's too scary. But if someone else says, I think you can do it, and I think, well, sometimes they can see the personality traits that, or the ability that you can't quite see yourself. So. We did Hamlet and he started off as a bit of a joke, you know, I said, and then she saw, she said at first she said no. And then she rung me back later and said, are you serious about it? I said, well, you know me, sir, I'm never really serious about anything, but that's again, <laughs> if I thought about anything too much, I think that's, that's my, that's been the sort of my mantra. Don't think about it too much and just get on with it. So um, we did Hamlet and then streetcar. Because again, at drama school, somebody said, you're too earthy to play Tennessee Williams. I mean, some of the things, I'm sure tutors just say them offhand and don't think that then they implant in your psyche for, so it was, again, it was like, what can we do that's a challenge? Scriker was, actually, that was Sarah's idea. I'd never read it. I'd, and I read it and went, I have no idea what this is about. <laughs> but if Sarah thinks it's good, it yeah. looks bonkers. I'll, I'll give it a go. So we just, it's trust. And we both get frightened. We're both like, oh, what are we doing? But I think it's just having that absolute, I trust her implicitly that she won't, you know, I mean, she's always supporting me. But again, when we're doing a production, it is very much an ensemble. It's not director and lead actor. She, you're, I'm in it, but she very much then creates an ensemble. Hamlet, she looks at all of her pieces as an ensemble. And I, I really respect that because you know sometimes I get annoyed because I want a bit more attention yeah. but it's how it should be yeah and it you when you talk about that kind of that trust I'm I know that you you're not moving into writing but you've been writing in the last few years so there's Beryl and various works and Beryl is still touring and they're doing productions I looked it up there's a production last year and this year and so on and so forth when you're when you're working when you're writing is it is it the sort of same creative energy that you bring to that, that you bring to performing? Or is it like a different bit of your creative self that you have to push? It's definitely a, 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 a different bit. And what I've found as well, I think the most enjoyable writing I did, I did a production of The Last Testament of Lillian Balocco for Whole City Culture, which Sarah um, directed, but it was, a, it was a real collaboration. And I think I've started to realise, you know, for me, it's, I remember on the 
on the poster it said written by Maxine Peake and I said well it wasn't really I brought the words Imogen Knight brought the movement Sarah brought the direction the actors brought their bit and for me that was when I went this is my thing it's sort of writing to a brief you know somebody going okay we want this and I got okay I'll write some scenes I'll do some words I'd I that but actually when I first wrote the radio play of of Beryl I just sat for days looking at the screen and, it, and I didn't know what to do. And actually, and I spoke to somebody who was a writer and they said, are you thinking about it? And I said, yeah. They said, well, you're working then. If you're thinking about what you're doing, you are working. And that was a big moment for me. But I didn't, I, I, I only wrote it because, you know, nobody else wanted to do it. I'd taken the idea to Justine Potter, who was a producer director and said, you know, can you get someone to write this for me? And she said, why don't you write it myself, yourself? And my partner had been saying that. And I was like, okay, but I didn't know where to start. But luckily, I had a lot of support around me. And because, you know, I knew how fortunate I was and that I got my work produced because I had a profile as an actor. You know, I don't think if I hadn't had that profile, my writing would have got anywhere. You know, and I always, people always say, why weren't you in Beryl? Why have you not been in your stage plays? I said, because I only do good writing. You know what I mean? It was a need. I wanted to tell the story. And again, I think my thing is, I just want to put some words down and go to people. I'm not precious. You take that, do what you want with it. And that's what I tried to do with Beryl. I was like, improvise around it, chop it up, mash it up. But just because I'd done theatre and education before I'd gone through drama school, and I love that element of devising, you know, a group together with many skills, dev- you know, devising pieces. And So is yeah. that what you did when you sort of converted it from radio to stage? Because it's very, it's a very physical piece. I mean, yeah. it lands a lot on kind of visual movement between characters and... Yeah, I just didn't know what to... I sat for ages going, what is this play about? Is this a... You know, initially it was... Charlie, Beryl's wife and his daughter Denise, you know, sat in the garage mulling through all Beryl's. And then I thought, oh no, let's, I just want to make this a fun night out. And I still remember James Brining on press night (laughs) coming up to me and went, we've sold out, we've had to extend a week, he said, and I don't understand, he said, because Maxie, you've not written a play. I mean, he meant it (laughs) the nicest possible way, but he was, he was in shock. Because I think he read it and went, <laughs> and I said, well, it was that idea of people going to the theatre and having to think too hard. And my biggest achievement was James said 30% of that audience had never been to the theatre. And I thought, job done. It's not, I'm not there to show my intellectual prowess, which I haven't got much anywhere. I was there to get bums on seats and people just to go away and went, oh, that was fun. I'll do that again. What's on next week? I'll go and see something else, you know, Brilliant. and that's, that's what is important to me. Maxine, I know um, that the MA students are going to ask you lots about writing. I just wanted to ask you one more question. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I worked with somebody on a book on Vivian Lee, who could, in some ways couldn't be more opposite to you, but of course she's the, the, the other famous Blanche. <laughs> and one of the things that um, people don't realise about her career is that she was very uh, choosy about the parts she played and she had aspiration to play particular parts, which you know, because of the studio structure and because of being married to Olivier, she never got to play. Are there, if there were like three roles or three writers or three directors you could work with who you haven't yet worked with, who would they be or what would those roles be? Oh, I think writers. I mean, writers, directors, I think for me, you know, Andrea Arnold, I'd love to work with, Lim Ramsey. Um, And I'd really love to work with Carol Morley again who's, you know, Stockport, uh, born and bred, writer, filmmaker. Um, those are the three, you know, I, I know I've, I'm sort of known for my television, but for me, film is still, even though I know everyone keeps saying it's a golden age of telly and is film going to survive this, you know, the COVID pandemic and what's happening. But I just, for me as an art form, film is, you know, really exciting. And I think, and I think in more in sync with theatre in a way because of the way it can it can express itself. And I know telly's catching up and there's some, you know, you know, superb TV at the moment, mainly coming from across the water. You know, I think, you know, we've, we've still got a little bit of work to do with some of the stories we're telling on sort of mainstream channels there. But, you know, don't get me wrong, there's still some fabulous stuff. 
but I think those three. I mean, there's there's countless. You, you, you know, um, I mean, I'm just been. I don't know if you've seen um, Saint Maud. I think Rose Glass is just an extraordinary director, and I mean Jennifer Ely and um, Martha Clark. I mean, just wonderful. What an amazing, exciting film that that is. Brilliant. Thanks, Maxine and John. Thank are you, you going to are you going to introduce the students now, or do I do it? How how are we moving on? Oh, I don't know. Do you want to? Is he there? I think they're just ready. To, I think they're just ready to come on. So I think, I think Imogen, um, Lydia. Um, and Caitlin, I'm actually doing that wrong. I think it's Lydia, Imogen, and Caitlin. Would you mind um, turning on your cameras and your and your and your and your mics? And I think we'll see you, and you'll be able to. I think Lydia, you're going to start off, so I'll I'll back out again. Thanks, Maxine. Thank you. Yep. So I'll um, I'll start off with. So in the spirit of it being International Women's Day. Um, as a woman, is there anything within a script that could potentially put you off the role? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think I can be a little bit too forensic at times. I, I always need to know what it is saying about... You, you get a lot of scripts that, OK, the female protagonist, you know, it's a, it's a lead female protagonist, but it, that the, the amount of lines doesn't matter. It's what is being said or what the story is saying about the woman. So a lot of the time I will turn down a script because I think it's not... And it, it doesn't matter the woman. It's not about the woman being likeable at all. You know what I mean? I think we need more unlike what is I mean, what does unlikable mean? But more complex, interesting, out there women on our screens whose stories, you know, just aren't based around men on, and uh, you know, missing children and blah blah blah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's what it's being. What's what is the script trying to say about this woman's journey? And a, a lot of the time, I come across, I come up with, come across scripts that I think uh, the women get punished for their sexual sexuality whether it's their sensuality or sexuality. And I, and I don't, and a lot of the time they're written by men and I don't think they quite realise. I think they think they're being quite sort of liberated in the expression of sort of a woman's female inner life. And I think that's another thing. What is the inner life of a lot of the women? Because I think sometimes, especially in a lead in something, you're, you can just appear as written as the character that things happen around. You don't have that in a life. You're just a construct for the drama to bounce off. And I think the best scripts, you know, create a woman that has an inner life and is the centre that the drama can function around as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Maxine. Um, so off the back of Lydia's question, um, my own dissertation that I'm writing at the moment is largely concerned with the representations of um, women in their 40s and 50s on television. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak a little to um, the kind of roles that you see as being available for women uh, in their 40s, 50s, 60s at the moment, because I find that I have so many favourite um, you know, actors um, in that age range and I'm so disappointed by the kind of roles um, I see them in. It's yeah. always often mothers and wives and they're kind of supporting roles to the men in the stories and they're brilliant actors and I just think why are they being underused and I wondered if you could um, yeah speak a little bit about that. Yeah it is I mean it's interesting because it, it even when I was at drama school we were told you know you get to your 40s and the parts will dry up although I was told I get to my 40s and because as a character actor <laughs> I probably wouldn't start working till right. middle age, but I think middle age in their eyes was a bit more, you know, I, I love Margaret Rutherford, but in a bit more Margaret, Margaret Rutherford S. But there aren't those parts because one thing as well, character parts for women now, are, are, I think a few and far between, you know, it's like I was saying about creating a woman with an inner life, you know, that, but um, yeah, it is, you do. I think the thing is there's, there are, you people go, well, look at the dramas. You know, you look at like Olivia Coleman, myself, you know, there's, there's um, you know, Saran Jones are coming up, people coming up to the, so I don't, I know Saran's not 40 yet. I don't think she's coming up. There's lots and lots of people, Amanda Abingdon doing the work, but it, it it's a small group as well. And I think it needs to be, you know, that is it's sort of the, the television 
diseases it's there's the same people you know keely Hose, blah 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 brilliant brilliant actors but it's the same people on the lists you know and i'm not complaining about it you know personally <laughs> but it does narrow it down and i i think you know it's a thought is still you can sort of cling on in there to your 40 sort of mid 40s late 40s but now i start going once you get to your 50s and 60s i mean the the, the pool of actors gets smaller because people obviously you know a lot of people it's just well why am i still doing this when the parts aren't aren't there but they aren't yeah it's just because there's not enough female writers being commissioned and when they are being commissioned the scripts you, you know, there seems to be this template about what the general public want. Well, the general public don't know. Do you think people want to see stories written? Do. Yeah. Yeah, I think of course they do. I mean, who's watching telly? I would say most people watching telly are women over 35 right. who are sitting down and turning on that television. It's the same with cinema. They think women don't go to the cinema. Women of that age have spending power now they've got you, 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 you know what I mean and I just think it's it's a complete it's misinformation on who is watching telly I know we're very obsessed in this country I think of getting young people to watch the telly but let's you know if they're watching things online that's brilliant that's fine they'll come to telly later on but this is we've got to get young people watching it well if they're not they're not then really cater for the people who are and, and cater for everybody and I think I find I watch a lot of stuff and go, I don't know these women. I read scripts and I go, I don't know these women. And it is sad to see amazing actors. And I've got actor friends and they're auditioning for six and seven lines in things. And I'm going, you're auditioning anyway. And then it's for tiny, tiny roles. And somebody, I remember years ago, put a tweet out, you know, all actresses work hard because if you, you know, if you come very, very lucky, you can play the wife, <laughs> you know, the wife, daughter or sister of a very successful man. And that still is, it's got better. But my argument is it's more female led, but also a female, you know, not, they put a one woman in the lead and then they'll pad it out with, you know, and then it's males. It's like, let's have more real female heavy dramas that are tackling some really interesting, interesting subject matters. And there's so much talent going by the wayside. And, um, you know, because we've got more, I've noticed it more and more, it is they're obsessed with youth making films and television with young characters and when I first started out that sort of wasn't the case but it's definitely shifted now it's definitely you know when I first started out you got you got the more what you did the more money you got and then I sort of remember hitting about 35 and doing a job and they said the young lead actress in it was getting more because she was tipped to be a future star and you go oh it's swapped then then it became about yeah it's just we're just youth obsessed aren't we and it's there's got to be a balance. You know, there's got to be a real balance. I remember when I was young, I didn't want, I didn't really want to watch dramas with people my age because to be honest, I couldn't relate to them either. So I was much more interested in watching. And there's higher stakes when characters are older. I think yeah. there's something about the stakes that's really interesting. Definitely. Well, thanks. Um, that, Sorry. <laughs> that, that makes me very happy because most of my writing is about middle-aged women. So Brilliant. thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, hi Maxine. Hi. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, um, what piece of advice would you give to someone um trying to break into the industry, or is there like a piece of advice that somebody gave you early on that has stayed with you? I think for me, the best piece of advice was actually an actor called Michael Culkin gave to me many years ago, and I just left drama school, and um, he'd come, he'd written a play, and he'd come to Rada to ask if students would read it and I remember putting my name down going I'll, I'll do this reading and he, he sort of came in and he spoke to us all and then he said to me and, and the end of the part and he gave me the part as the nurse <laughs> so a couple of lines and I bumped into him years later and I said what was uh and he said I'm so sorry I, I just did that whole thing you were northern I thought that's all you could play blah 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 and actually and then after that we became good friends but the best piece of advice he gave to me was you you your work is based not on what you do it's what you don't do so for me as an actor, that really stuck. And I am quite choosy about what I do, you know, I mean, within the remit of what I can be choosy around. So that was really important about having choices. And it's the only power you've got. 
as a writer, as, a, as an actor, and especially as a female, is to say no. And it's having more confidence to go, no, actually, I don't have to do that. Why? You know, because I think I was very grateful when I started out. Oh, you've given me a job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's all of that sort of too humble. And actually, it's like, do I want to do this? Does this speak to me? Am I interested? What do I want? You know, and I think very much as, you know, as a, as, as a creative being, we've got to start going, why am I doing this? And what does it, it mean to me? And I think you can only propel. So then once I started doing work that actually spoke to me, that I got better, you know, and it yeah. is about doing it. It's about, you know, I was not a very good actor. I'm not saying I'm a great actor now, but I was terrible when I started out. And I was lucky that people kept giving me chances, but it's the same with the writing. It's about keep doing it. You've got to keep doing it. Athletes train, you know, actors, writers, artists, we've got to keep training. I mean, I know it's harder for actors because, you know, where do you, you know, unless you want to stand up and do monologues to yourself. <laughs> but there's so much you can do now. I think your generation, it's really exciting because you've got more technology at your fingertips. And I think it's so much about coming together. It is that community feel, supporting each other, but also getting in groups and making work. Because if mm. people are not going to give you the commissions, then sodden. It's about getting out there and doing it yourself, you know. Just yeah. because they're in those positions don't need, mean to say they actually know what people want and what's good. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think now we're going to move to um, audience Q&A. Um, so... Imogen Chillington, another Imogen, has a great question. Um, she's writing her dissertation um, at the moment, looking at the representation of Northern women in British cinema. And she was wondering um, about your thoughts on the representation of Northern women in British film. Obviously, so much of your own work um, sees you in the North and you know you have that great relationship with the Royal Exchange as well. Um, so yeah, your thoughts on that. <laughs> I think especially cinema northern women in cinema and I mean obviously that you know in the 60s there was a bit of a heyday wasn't there with uh but again, you know what I don't like the term kitchen sink but if you look in a lot of the, the movies that came out at that point were very much about a working class culture but you know I remember when I was younger, these were all my favourite films, you know, kind of loving Saturday night, Sunday morning, this sporting life. And it's only when I got a little bit older, I started to go on the R about men, uh, sort of railing against the system, but also against the women in their lives. That I thought, you know, like, you know, I mean, there were some, you know, more interesting, but th those mainstream sort of, you know, 60s classics, when you look, look back in anger, very much of that point. And it is about, were it, you know, Northern women represented on film? And I still think there's an issue. There's an issue with, you know, the, the social economic, you know, sort of status of a, of a Northern woman, what not, you know, what stories we're telling about Northern women. It's always steeped very much in the class. It's usually a story, you know, and I've done many of those things, you know, poverty, struggling, you know, they do need, I think we do need to sort of break the mould a little bit more about how we tell stories in the North, because I still think it's part of the problem where there's still a lot of prejudice about what happens in the North of England. And now people see the North of England that it's not this culturally diverse place, you know, and it's exciting and culturally there's a, it's a hotbed and there's so much going on and, you know, fantastic universities like Manchester turning out all this talent, you know, I think it can still suffer because of its representations in the media, but women especially, I think still, you're either, it's still that brassy, bold, mm. outspoken, a little bit free and loose, you know, as I always used to get offered good time girls. And I used to go into auditions and go, can you explain to me what you mean by a good time girl? And then they'd flush because, you know, it'd be like, you know, she's a, do you mean promiscuous? Is that what you mean? <laughs> you know, that, it's just like, no, I always say being Northern isn't a character trait. I mean, I know they can, you know, there's elements and people can say to me, oh, you're so Northern, you know, and it's, oh, thank you, please. Sorry, sorry, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I think a lot of it's just, being British isn't it or just being it's I don't know maybe being working class maybe feeling slightly the underdog I don't know but it's yeah we need to we do still got a lot of work to do at chipping away stereotypes I think of, of women in, in film but you know it's happening and again there's a young generation coming up of 
female female filmmakers especially that I think is really really exciting yeah great thank you okay I've got a question here from it's anonymous I think so is there a project you've seen recently whether film or tv that you found particularly innovative or refreshing and if so what about it felt new to you to be honest I think I'm gonna have to be pretty um I'm gonna have to go for the probably what everybody else has been saying since but I was talking to a friend today is I may destroy you the Michaela Cole definitely yeah I mean just for me you know in a way you think wow you know it's 20 it was 2020 you know in the series out and talk, the, the the women's issues that she tackled were still seen as you know shocking I mean my favorite bit really I mean there's lots of favorite bits but when there's the period clot on the bed you know, talk about women's periods, women's bodies. But it was also about, you know, an all black drama that wasn't, it was about young professional people. It was about the real, but it was more than that. It was about being a woman. It was about being young. It was about living in London. It was about living wherever. It was just about the human experience. And I think she did it with such lightness of touch and such understanding. And I found it really moved, I just was really moved by the care she'd taken about women and women's issues and women's stories and what we're still battling against in this day and age. And, and that she, she really opened a conversation up for people, you know, really made you think of, and I think that's the best telly. It doesn't hit you over the head, but you start thinking, yes, why, why do we do that? What, what, you know, about all the issues and, you know, about, uh, you know, the um, Papa Esadu's character as well, about consent, about what that means. And I think that's so important. And I think, yeah, it was, I just felt it, it just exploded, uh, you know, it just, it, it just blew the cobwebs away of a lot of, of our television. And I just thought it was extraordinary. Such a good choice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, Sam Benfold wanted to know, um, how did you feel about playing a character such as Myra Hindley and um, how did you manage to shed the character at the end of the day when you got home? Um, I mean, again, I would, when I was talking earlier on about my naivety, I'd heard that the part was, I, I, a friend of mine is a location manager, so he goes out and finds all the, you know, as you know, finds all the filming locations early on and he sort of told said to me, you know, they're doing a drama about um, the Moors murders. And I went, are they? And, um, and I thought, wow, that'll be fascinating. So I got onto my agent. He was always sick of me. I was always hearing news before I'm ringing up and going, I believe this is happening. She was like, where have you got this from now? So I got her to push and push and push for it. And initially they didn't want to, they were like, no, Maxine, just comedy. She's been in shameless. It might give a wrong impression. Anyway, eventually after lots of banging on the door and I think wearing them down, I got the part. And I remember speaking to other actor friends who were going up for it and they were a little bit in two minds about it. But for me as an acting challenge, you know, I thought about it like that. I thought to be able to portray that person, you know, be able to go somewhere into that 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 world as well, but try and under, not understand because I don't think you can ever you can never understand. Mm. But it was a, such a, a period in time of Manchester, and it was such a period in time in 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 the UK because it was the sixties and the world was changing and what you know, there was the, the amalgamate, you know, sort of accumulation of all those things. And, and out of that came these two, you know, monsters, really. Um, so I, yeah, I, I shed in the character. I, I always used to be very much like, oh, I don't, that doesn't happen to me. It doesn't, I do the part and I switch off. But I think Myra was the first part that, it does leave a residue. It does leave, it's a bit like a hangover. It takes... You're filming, so you don't really think about it, and you're working because you're constantly researching. It was one of those that all the time people were sending me more information as I'm filming that they found, or the production was saying, we've just found this. I was reading, reading, reading the four actors, Sean Harris, Matthew McNulty, and Joanne Froggett. We were sort of this intense little group sh swapping information. So it was it was a very intense period. So I didn't, you know, when I'd come home, I'd still be sort of working. And there were long days anyway. So it was only when I finished. It did take me quite a while to sort of I can't really explain it but you just there's a heaviness with it there's a real heaviness that and I'm, I was very careful not to take myself to too dark a place I think you know some actors do but that doesn't work for me and I think you've got to protect yourself because I've seen 
actors and they've got themselves in in a bit of a state, you know, with it. I, I do try and keep it at arm's length as, as, as much as I can, you know, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, we have another question um, from Emma White, um, who asked an interesting question. She says, um, what do you think theatre might look like after COVID and what changes do you want to see? What I'd like to see is, is obviously more accessible theatre, theatre in maybe different spaces. You know, I think I think a wider variety, a, a, a bigger a bigger scope within the storytelling. But I think as well, theatre has been stripped back and actually the attention being focused on the stage. I think a lot of theatres, and I might be speaking out of term, but end up, what goes on the stage seems to be the, sometimes a bit of an afterthought. You know, there's a lot, you know, you'll go into the theatre and there's a lot of people working in, you know, an office doing, you know, doing great jobs. But I think sometimes this, the actual production and how it's made and the finance that goes into it can be, you know, can be sort of held back. So I think really focusing on on the production and on the audiences really getting people back in and just being very delicate and listening to what people want and and hopefully if if, if things you know there isn't a lot of money we're going to have to be more imaginative which is actually in a way exciting I mean it's all right for me to say my so I meant you know my house and I'm fine and you know financially I'm okay it's it, you know I don't want to sound patronizing but I think there can be an excitement there that and the, the innovation, we're going to have to use our imagination. And what does what does that mean? And obviously, I hope it'll give more accessibility to people, not only to the audiences, but to the people, the writers, the performers, the stage technicians. You know, it'll it'll explode the doors open. And I think we've got an opportunity to to grab that while we can before they slam the doors shut. You know. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so we've got a question here from Martha Edwards and she says, please, could you share any advice you have about experiencing pressure about your physical appearance when starting out in acting? Yeah, I mean, when I started out, I mean, I was, you know, I was a lot sort of heavier and I, every character I got offered had fat before the title. <laughs> <laughs> you, it's you know I sometimes say within the acting world things get said in 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 on casting breakdowns things get said in audition rooms that in any other profession there would be a tribunal I think things are getting better but people feel they can say whatever because you're just a desperate actor desperate for a job so they can say what they want and I think that culture has really got to change and there's got to be more respect for actors and actors craft you know just things like I know equity and they're working on just when you audition and getting feedback but some of the things that are said you know I always, I mean I've said before I got all that can you um, you know your character's educated what you're going to do about your accent you know things like that and you do sometimes there's certain producers and executive producers that you think you should come and live in Manchester for six months and really get under the skin of what you know, and not just Manchester, Newcastle, everywhere, Scotland, really get, you know, under the skin of what it's about. But as, as a woman, so I sort of protected myself going, okay, that's, you know, I'm stuck with that. And things that I'd read and I'd go, I'd really like to play this part of my agent and say, well, they're just looking for normal. They're looking for normal girls. So it was, it was hard, but... I think what kept me going is it's a cruel business and actually there's a lot of idiots in it as well. Sometimes you can just go, I feel superior, you're an idiot. Um, you're in a position of power really, but you know, but it doesn't mean you know what you're doing. And it's hard and I did give in and lose the weight. You know, and sometimes I think, you know, a friend of mine said, oh, you should have stuck at it. You could have been a fat Juliet. <laughs> you know, you could have done, but I don't suppose, you know, I, I don't know, but it's just, take, you've got to take it on the chair. And if people do say anything, report them. Helen Mirren said in an interview, I know it's different, but I mean, and you know, she's known for a, a fabulous acting and also, you know, she's a, you know, she's a sort of a thinking man, isn't she? But she said, 
you know, she wished in her career, she told people to F off more. And I think it's about calling people out about it. You know what I mean? We've yes. got to, it's got to be a culture now where there's support. And if somebody says it's about telling your agent, it's about confronting the person in the room, and it's hard because you are self-employed. And we know in this business, there's writers or whatever, there's, there's a thousand people behind you ready to step in. So we've got to start looking out for each other a bit more and calling people out on it and going, you can't talk to people like that. And report, you know, report, reporting it. It's shocking. Definitely, yeah. Um, Kay Kitchen asks, um, if you had the opportunity to work on anything, um, what would the role, what would your dream role be and why? What would my dream role be? What would my dream role be? I'd love playing real life characters. I really enjoy that. Probably because you get all the, um, you know, it's all the research is there at your fingertips most of the time. So there is sort of a, a roster of sort of real life characters I'd, I'd like to play, but I'm, I've always been very good at knowing what I don't want to do. And I know what, what I want. What would you not want to do? <laughs> well, there's lots of stuff I wouldn't want to do. Anything, you know, is detrimental to women, detrimental to any, you know what I mean? That, yeah, bad writing, don't want to do that. Not work with nice people, don't want to do that. And, um, you know, I want, I don't want to do dramas that misrepresent people. You know what I mean? Misrepresent whatever that, you know, any, any part of our community within, you know, within, well, globally in, in the United Kingdom. I just don't want to do being parts that are bad, bad represent, you know, bad representation. Mm. That's my, yeah, that's, that's a definite no, no for me. Thank you. Um, Alice Ty has asked, what's been the toughest and most raw role you've had to play? Toughest role? I think actually Blanche in Streetcar Named Desire was the toughest because I didn't know if I was ever going to get there. I remember sort of the first two weeks in rehearsal and it was terrible. I was just not you know it wasn't clicking nothing was clicking and I, and there's that terrible thing that I always try not to do but you start getting self-conscious in front of the other actors because you can slightly see the fear in their eyes <laughs> that they're going to be on stage with this and you know it's that thing if you're not giving them what they need then you're not helping their performance you know what I mean it's that two-way so I do remember thinking you know I've a cut off you know a bit enough mother can you obviously Hamlet physically once I was up and doing that that you know that did me in that completely as a as a physical as a piece and the the physicality of it and the en actual physical energy it took you know and I have to say I mean again I'm sorry no I'm not sorry for the men on the <laughs> but I think we forget about female actors that we have things like periods yeah that can be really draining and really mm -hmm. exhausting and you know when you're trying to combat a 10 day flood and get on stage and do that for seven weeks, you know, in a, in a giant pair of tiny ladies pants, because you <laughs> don't want to, you know, leak everywhere and do, you know, and it's, I mean, people go, oh, I can't believe it's talking, but it needs to be spoken about. Yeah, and, it does. You know, and people, they compare you to the men and I think, well, I'd like them to, to do it with, and you know, the blood levels of, when I went to the doctors afterwards, he said, you know, you you need you know you need you'll need an iron transfusion. This is what what you've been running on, mm -hmm. and we do. It's all those things, extra things that women have to deal with. You know, periods, motherhood, menopause. You, you know, and then get on stage and act as well. You know, that are not talked about enough. I think. You know, as as an extra challenge to face, as well as you know, getting on getting on stage and taking on a part. Mm -hmm. Good, good stuff to be talking about on our International Women's Day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I've got one question here, and I feel like I have to ask this because The Falling is one of my favourite films. Um, but it's 
from Matthew Needham. It says, I would like to ask what it was like working on The Falling with Carol Morley. What was the most challenging thing about playing that role? What was it like? Well, I've known Carol for years. I did one of Carol's sort of quite early short films, um, uh, Madness. Well, I'd done a couple. She'd had a, she was entered into a she was entering a competition and she had to make a short film in a day. I can't, I can't remember what it was called now. And I'd got, I still remember, I'd got a call from my then agent saying, and I'd seen alcohol years. My then agent said, um, oh, you've, I'd, I'd just been offered three episodes of quite a well-known sort of, uh, I don't know what you call it, sci-fi drama. <laughs> and uh, my um, agent said, you've just had a call from this woman, Carol Morley. She wants you to meet her for a short film, but it clashes. And I said, I've got to meet her. And she was like, what? And I said, it's Carol Morley. She did alcohol years. She's amazing. Anyway, I went down to meet Carol. I was really nervous. I thought she'd be dead intense. And then Carol comes in. She's like a ray of sunshine. She's amazing. So I met Carol. We hit it off. So I did a couple of shots with her. And then I did a first sort of film that was, you know, sort of crowdfunded called The Edge. And then The Falling came in. And I remember, you know, I think she had a bit of difficulty getting me cast. It's always the way because... I think mm. at the time I was still seeing as too much of a telly face. Blah, blah, blah. Sorry, I'm going off. <laughs> I'm going off the visual. Um, but it was brilliant because Carol, I mean, working with Carol before, she has a real freedom to her. It really feels like play because that's Carol's personality. She's very playful. She's very instinctive and intuitive. So it was, I mean, one of the difficult bits was she said to me, you know, I don't want you being all friendly and warm with Maisie. Williams was playing my daughter and I said oh you're joking don't make me do that I don't do method I remember that really. actually yeah yeah amazing <laughs> Williams did actually accuse me of being a method actor and I've never been so insulted in all my life I was like oh, I was mortally wounded never been quite looking in the eye since but no, I'm joking but um <laughs> so I just used to go and I was like, oh don't make me do this so I used to go and sit upstairs in Joe Cole's character's room because they'd stuff the books full of um, books on the occult so I'd give myself an education on the occult <laughs> for two weeks but it wasn't hard I mean to me it it was fun if the best even if you go into the deepest darkest places if it's a if it's a fun safe space I think you can have the best fun still because you know you can go to places and you're supported and that's what Carol Carol did she's not she's not she's in very she, you know her work's intense but she's not in that way of she just lets you run with it and and sort of the best directors do you know and obviously she'd written it herself but she she nudged you know it's like it's it's just tiny little taps to get you and I, I really love you know I loved it and I love watching the youngsters Maisie and Joe Florence Pugh's first job I mean as soon as Florence Pugh walked on the set everybody went she's a star it's just some people have just got it and she just before she'd even acted you could just she had a an aura about her that you just thought this girl's you know she's got something really special so it was brilliant it was just fabulous to be part of but yeah I'm just hoping Carol did say I was amusing an article once but I'm like right well where's the next job then Marla <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Maxine. Um, I'm coming in again now because it's eight o'clock, but it seems really right that we should be finishing on such a brilliant and generous answer about collaboration and about working and being inspired by the people you work with as well. I'd like to thank Maggie Gale, and I'd like to thank Lydia and Imogen and Caitlin um, for their questions and also for handling all of the many, many questions that came in tonight. And they were brilliant questions. And thanks to all of you um, who tuned in tonight and who came along um, to this um, overdue session. Um, I think a lot of the other questions were sort of answered because Maxine answered specific questions so generously, they were kind of answered um, by the way um, many of them. And I think that what I'm taking away from it, and I hope many of you be taking away from it too, is that sense of being able to hang on to your ideas and your vision of what it is that you want to do and to stand up for it. And it's just great to see you talking about looking for new work as well, Maxine, and still trying things out as well, having done, um, having done so much as we've talked about um, tonight. And we're all looking forward. I know I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon on stage, I hope, um, as well as on screen. So I hope everybody is going to be able to uh, use that icon and
clap and thank uh, Maxine um, for being with us um, tonight. I have one final thing to say, which is that our next event is on Monday and it's our colleague um, Ella Wakatama and she's going to be talking to two of those new voices and um, the kinds of voices that uh, Maxine was so encouraging to tonight, um, Nadine Forna and Justin Deaver. And they're going to be reading from their um, first novels um, and you're going to have first sight and first hearing um, of their work when they talk to Ella about those novels next Monday. Um, but thanks everybody for coming and thanks again, Maxine. And I'm going to stick a link to that event in now.